Today is Good Friday, and it's a good day to talk about economics. Um, a couple of ground rules I'd like to go over. Um, please have your microphones and cameras off during the entire presentation and at the end, because uh, we'll use the chat for questions. Um, anytime you can send a question, but specifically at the end, we'll address those questions. And as I said, the Q&A, we'll use the chat. We also have uh, feedback, which has been working great. People have been letting us know what they wanna see, what they liked or didn't like. So if you just take down that URL and it, there's three quick questions and, and, uh, and we're ready to, to go from there. So, okay, um, to start off, we've got Brian Parman. Hey, uh, <clears throat> nice to talk to everybody on a holiday. Thanks for joining us on this Good Friday. I know a lot of people are off work today and hopefully enjoying a long weekend, although some of us have been home long enough that we're probably ready to do something else. But today I'm going to do a little bit of uh, the macro situation update, uh, talk a little bit about production costs, namely fertilizer, and then move on into uh, uh, land values. So uh, the University of Michigan and they're pretty famous for this. They do a, a consumer sentiment index, okay? And what it basically gauges, long story short, is it just talks about how consumers are feeling about the economy and, and how they're feeling about income and how they're feeling about their, basically their net worth. In other words, home values, their 401ks and things like that. And if you look at this chart, we'd been moving up nicely you know, and, and in fact, we'd hit new highs just to start the year 2020, or not new highs, but consumer confidence was very high, getting close to that 100 mark. And then in the, the, the dotted line that you see, not the blue one, but the dotted one, that's the weekly, uh, uh, they, they do this every uh, weekly survey. And you can see that that has just plummeted dramatically. The blue line is the uh, three month moving average. And I'm sorry, the dotted line is monthly and the, and the blue line is three month moving average. And you can see that in the last month, consumer confidence has absolutely cratered. In fact, since they've been tracking it, they say it's the, uh, the lowest, uh, the largest drop that has happened uh, since it's been recorded. So one of the things that's been uh, talked about in the last couple of days and another action that our federal government is taking is the Fed has announced another 2.3 trillion in rescue slash stimulus. Now this is different than the 2.2 trillion CARES Act that was planned. And I just put 2.3 trillion dollars, okay, in, in actual numbers there on the screen, you could see it, that's four commas in, in a trillion. So that's a really huge number. We throw it around like it's nothing, but it is a lot of money. And really what this is doing is backing some of the programming and uh, uh, l access to loans and liquidity that our, the government has tried to put in place. Somebody has to buy up or back that debt. In other words, banks don't necessarily want to go loan to a business that is not making any money because they view that as bad debt. So you've got this $600 billion in Main Street lending fund for small to mid-sized businesses. That's a backing. So you still go through the a bank, but then they buy up or guarantee the debt at $600 billion and they got to have the money there. Uh, $500 billion for short-term notes directly purchased from states, counties, and cities. This is sort of a, um, a way for the Fed to help prop up states and municipalities who are uh, losing a lot of money, whether it's sales tax revenue or income tax or whatever the case may be, to continue services moving along without uh, uh, going broke. Then the other thing they're going to do, and this is a big deal, is they're going to buy what are called junk bonds. These are non-investment grade. Some people call them high yielding bonds, but they are companies who their balance sheets aren't that strong, their cash flows aren't that strong, uh, and they're going to buy them up. Now, they had to have been high uh, investment grade bonds before things took a turn after COVID, but if their balance sheets and their cash flows and they were downgraded by Moody's, say, to junk bond status, the Fed will back those, and they're going to buy highly rated new issues of uh, collateralized loan obligations and mortgage-backed securities, something that they did back in the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Now, this is the Fed taking on a lot of risk that they never really have ever taken on in history. I mean, they're, these are some risky assets that they are backing that they pretty much have never stepped in and, and backed in, in, uh, previously. So this is some historic stuff going on here and aggressiveness by the Fed. So the next slide shows, again, 
uh, let's talk about unemployment right quick. Uh, the previous peak for unemployment adjusted for population growth was in 1982, and I adjusted it upwards to uh, 900,000. It was actually 695, but if you adjust for population growth since then, it would have been the equivalent to 900,000. If you look to the right of that chart, you see this blue line going straight up. So the next slide, I zoom in on a year. Okay, I zoom in on the uh, following uh, this year. So this is just a year timeline. So we can see what that blue line actually means. And what that blue line is, is the last three weeks, new filings of unemployment. So March 21st. So again, the previous record was 900,000. March 21st, we had 3.28 million new filings for unemployment. March 28th, the week ending March 28th, that is, it was 6.87 million. This was revised up. I think it was 6.6 .6 when it first came out, but they revised it up to 6.87. And then the week ending last Saturday was 6.6 .6 million. So still that March 28th number is a record, but 6.6 .6 million. So to put into perspective, typically when we see unemployment go on the rise, it's a, it's a buildup. You know, you got this, you know, may, I don't want to call it slow, but you've got this buildup of 300, 400,000 new filings per week for several weeks or months, and the unemployment rate increases. This is historic in the sense that this is putting millions and millions of people on new unemployment rolls in a matter of just a few weeks. This is reaching some of the highest levels we've ever had in probably the shortest time that's ever uh, uh, occurred uh, in, in history. So my next slide kind of breaks down the numbers here. So again, the week ending March 21st was 3.28, uh, week ending uh, March 21st, 6.87, and then April 4th, 6.6. Previously, before all this happened, our, we had 5.8 million people considered unemployed. You add that to the totals previously, and I'm assuming that there wasn't a whole lot of job creation, that yields a total of approximately 22 to 22 and a half million unemployed, up from 5.8 three weeks ago. So the labor force participation rate is roughly 164.5 million. So I estimate that our unemployment rate went from 3.5% to 13.5% in a matter of three weeks. So literally added 10% unemployment in three weeks. The peaks of unemployment, uh, just to show some historical perspective, in 2009, the height of the financial crisis, it was 9.9%. .9%. In 1982, another big recession, it was 10.8%. And in 1933, which was the height of the Great Depression, it was 25%. That's estimated because they didn't really collect data very strongly back then. Now, again, though, this is not the depression level, and I don't want to make that case that it is because while the peak was 25% during the 30s, there were years and years and years that it was 15, 14, 17, 19% leading up to that, and then in subsequent years. It basically lasted a decade. The same thing with 1982. There were years before 10.8% that were 7.7%, 8%, and then subsequent years, same thing with 2009. So in this case, and why it's so historic is we have never went from an unemployment rate that low to one that high that fast, not even close. It's typically, like I said, a build up and then a grind downwards. And that's why when folks are talking about the recovery, how quick it might be is because this came on so quickly. Uh, we shut down, we shut down sectors of the economy abruptly. People lost their job instantaneously. They're still losing their jobs. There is some fallout from that happening, uh, but we'll see how that, uh, how that translates out uh, in the future. So now I wanna shift gears here to uh, uh, input costs and fertilizer. So on my next slide, I just took this uh, yesterday, uh, took this graph from DTN, and it shows the price uh, uh, for the cost of nitrogen fertilizer per pound, okay? And we've got a few different uh, products here. We've got anhydrous, which is the green line, urea, which is the red, and then 28 and 32, which are the orange and blue. And you can see that right now, if we look at anhydrous, I always base everything off of anhydrous because that's from which all these other fertilizers come. It's not as low as the previous low we saw back between 17 and 18, which uh, you guys all remember was, was a pretty good year for fertilizer. But right now, uh, we are definitely a lot lower than we were last, uh, last year. Last year, we had a little bit of a spike in fertilizer prices. A lot of that had to do with wet weather and problems in planting in the Corn Belt. So far this year, we haven't had those problems. Logistically, things are solid. So we've seen a bit of a, a you know, a decrease in fertilizer prices, which has been a help. My next slide, 
uh, I'm looking at, in, th in this case, DAP, diammonium phosphate. And if you look at the red, that's the 2020 price per ton of uh, DAP. And that's considerably lower than it was in 2019, which is the green line you see way above. I mean, we're talking $100 a ton cheaper. Now that's real savings, you know, basically a drop of 20% and well below the five-year average, which is that gray dotted line. So some real relief in the price of phosphate. Now on my next slide, I show uh, potash. Potash not as cheap as 2018, but still cheaper than last year, 2019, and well cheaper than this, this uh, average seasonal time in April uh, from the five-year average. So down there around $370 a ton. So one of the things that's a, a bright spot that we have going on right now as we head into planting season, uh, Nebraska's pretty much done. From what I'm hearing, I was applying some fertilizer, not done planting, but fertilizer application uh, with the anhydrous, same thing in Iowa is mostly done. So it doesn't look like we're going to have too many problems, at least I hope, logistically getting our, our, our starter fertilizers, our phos uh, phosphorus and our, and our uh, nitrogen fertilizers heading into this planting season. So that's good news. Now I want to talk about land values real quick. All right, so we put out a report on Friday on pasture land and then on I believe it was Tuesday no Monday on cropland and I'll give you the Cliffs Notes version of the report and what I said was that cropland uh, values and rents are flat and if you look at my graph it's pretty easy to see that that's the case you got the blue line which is the land value and that's on the left axis you got the red line which is the average cash rent for the state and that's on the right axis and pretty much since about 2015, we have been flat. We basically haven't budged enough to really talk about. And I equate most of those movements you see in rent and just noise. I think if we were able to get more and better data, it'd probably just be flat there without those tiny little peaks and, and movements. So right now, for, uh, going into 2020, cash rents and land values, I don't see any change there. That's that is in a way that's very helpful in the sense that we land values is a big store of our credit. That's how we're able to get financing or secure financing, collateralize any debt on land. And so the fact that they haven't dropped much has been a good thing. And the biggest reason why being low interest rates and ad hoc farm programs helping us out meet cash flow ob obligations. Rents haven't come down because they really haven't needed to. The next slide I show pasture land values. Yeah, they're down a little bit in the last year coming off of uh, those highs, they haven't really been as flat as cropland values, but still holding on pretty strong. In the report, I say they're down slightly, uh, and, and you can see why uh, pasture land values being the orange line, uh, pasture land rents being the blue line. They've, they've come down in the last year or so. Livestock prices haven't been that great. They haven't been horrible either though. And again, it's, it's looking pretty flat for the most part. And, and while these movements are occurring, when you look to the left of the graph and you see what was going on in the years leading up to it, we are relatively flat compared to uh, what's happened in the past. So I'd just like to sum it up, I believe, uh, with this on the land values front in my last slide shows. Interest rates, I, they are going to remain low for the foreseeable future as, as, as aggressive as the Fed is being right now. We're not going to go to negative rates. You can see not, not just what I showed at the beginning of this talk, but the actions that they've taken even prior to that. It's, some folks are saying their balance sheet may hit $10 trillion by the end of the year. There is no way they're hiking interest rates in the near future. They'll, they'll divest from those other things before that happens. So I expect interest rates to stay low for a while. Uh, government support programs for ag, we don't know what they are going to look like yet, uh, but we know that they're probably coming, or we believe that they're probably coming. So that's going to help meet cash flow obligations probably once again. Every time it looks like we're up against it, something comes down the pike that winds up helping us out, and uh, things, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And the biggest, can, the biggest thing we have going, and this is kind of leading into uh, Frayne Olson and Tim Petrie's talks, and Production and demand conditions are going to play a key role heading into, into this next year. And a big one being on the macro front, consumer confidence. And consumer confidence, even if we recover, even if it turns out to be the case that COVID isn't as bad as we thought, that we're able to come out sooner, the big question is going to be, are consumers going to change their behavior in the short run or the intermediate term 
out of fear or concern or whatever the case may be. And we don't get that big rally. We don't get people flooding the restaurants because they're a little bit nervous about being in crowds, even after we're told that most of the, the worst is over and that, and that things aren't, uh, things are closer to, to normal again. And that's, that's what they that's what we have to watch because when over 70% of the economy is, is consumer driven, well, how, like, how consumers think and how they behave is key to, to our recovery. And so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, my name is Frain Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, I, today, I'm going to try and answer two basic questions that I've been getting um, or try to answer. One of them is uh, most common question I'm getting. So when do we think we'll start to see this recovery or pickup, especially in the grain markets? And then the second question is, how quickly do you think we'll get it? And obviously, nobody knows that for sure. Um, we're all speculating at this point. Uh, Brian did a really nice job of kind of setting up the, the, the macro economy and what, what, what consumers may be doing. And I'm going to touch on that as, a little bit as well. Um, so first, we don't know when it's going to happen. And my, my viewpoint right now is that the recovery in grain prices may not come equally as rapidly for all of the grains. And we might see differences. We might have some, some leaders and some followers in that whole process. So my first slide um, is, is really talking about the historic corn usage. And I'm trying to differentiate between domestic demand or what's happening domestically and what's happening internationally. And again, that was kind of the second set of questions I'm, I'm getting now and some of the information and feedback that you folks gave us from last week is a little bit deeper dive into what's happening on the export market side. So if I'm using USDA information, um, these are the categories that USDA uses in the WASDE report or their estimates for corn usage. Um, we use the term usage instead of demand, but it's, it's basically where's our corn going? And we have several different buckets on the corn side. Uh, the blue line is feed in residual. Let's, for right now, I'll just call that the feed pile. Um, the red line is ethanol. The black line is exports. And the green line is pretty much everything else. So those little dotted lines on the far right hand side is the current USDA forecast. And again, as of Thursday, we got some updated numbers. So I wanna talk a little bit on the, on the domestic side. Corn is very, very domestic based. Um, we do have exports. Um, the, the export pace for corn is forecasted to slip slightly from last year. Um, and I'll show you an update on, on where we're at right now today. Uh, but the, I guess the big question for corn is what's happening domestically. And again, Tim is going to talk a little bit more about on the, on the, on the livestock and the meat side. Um, when it comes to feed and feed supply or feed usage, we're really more concerned about the number of animals. Um, and yes, the profitability of the industry makes a difference. But the real question we're worried about is what's, what's the number of animals we have to feed and what's the growth rate in those, in those animal, popula animal populations. And again, there's still some uncertainty longer term about what this growth rate or what the change in, in animal numbers will be as we move forward. On the ethanol side, again, two big uses, feed and ethanol. I know Dave Ripplinger is gonna talk some more about the ethanol industry, some of the challenges they're facing right now. USDA did recognize that um, uh, ethanol production has been dropping and dropping fairly quickly. They did adjust their forecast for total corn use this year. So corn is really a domestic um, market and, and we can watch what's happening domestically and look for what, it, what again, potentially changes in consumer and consumer behaviors looking at. On the next slide, I tried to summarize a bit more about the rate of export for corn. So this is a cumulative export sales. So every time we make an export sale, we add it to the pile of exports. So we'd like to see those lines on that graph grow as quickly as possible. Um, the uh, red line is where we are today. That's the 2018-19, uh, yeah, 2019-20 marketing year, the one we're in right now for old crop. Um, the black line is uh, last, excuse me, let me get my colors right here. The green line, excuse me, is last year's numbers. Oh, there we go. I'm, I'm, I'm clicking around on the wrong, wrong buttons here. Um, so the green line, shoot, there we go. The uh, green line is last year's numbers. Uh, obviously, export pace in corn right now is, is much slower than we've seen in the last couple of years. 
it's, it's paralleling very closely what we saw in 2015, 16. Now in 15 and 16, we did see a slight acceleration as we moved into the summer months. Hopefully that acceleration in export sales will continue. On the next slide, I shift into soybeans and the usage for soybeans is slightly different. And again, now on, on the soybean side, we have more of a 50-50 balance between what's happening domestically as far as crush, crushing into oil and meal, um, as well as what's happening on the export side. Uh, historically, or the last several years, we've been talking about the growth in exports and export pace, primarily because of China and obviously because of the U.S.-China trade war that, that has taken uh, considerable retraction here in the last year or so. Um, the current USDA forecast is for our soybean export sales to follow or track very similar to what it did last year. Um, and, and actually, what we're seeing today is, is very similar. Timing is a little bit different, but the quantities are very similar. So on the next slide, we're, we're looking at weekly export sales for soybeans. And the reason I do weekly export sales is because we have this big seasonal export pattern in soybeans. For corn and wheat, we don't see uh, a, a real seasonal pattern. It tends to be much more equal or more uniform throughout the, throughout the year. But on soybeans, we have this peak export demand kind of during our export sales period during the October, November, December time period. And then as we move into the summer months, our export sales, those new contracts that enter into the market, the new buyers that come and buy US, US grains, tends to slow very, very quickly. So the, once again, the red line is this year's numbers, so 2019, 2020. The black line is last year's numbers. And again, this would be all export sales. This is for everybody that we sell uh, soybeans to. You can see that this year it's, it's following much more closely to that seasonal pattern, although the peaks have not been as high. Obviously, we missed some of the export season last fall, and, and our total export sales are down from what we've seen previously. On the next slide, I did the exact same graphic, but this would be for soybean sales, U.S. soybean sales to China only. Now, the point I want to make here is that, you know, the, the Chinese now have come back into the U.S. market. They haven't been buying the quantities that everybody was hoping or expecting, but that purchase pattern, the seasonality, seems to be much more similar to what we saw before, with the exception, of course, of, two, of last year with, because of the trade war and the black line. So you notice that the purchases China made last year um, based on the black line was much more backloaded. It was much more, we had a couple big sales in this February, March time period, and then really nothing until later on in the July, August time period. Now this year, they have made some purchases uh, just after our harvest was completed, but recently they're, they have not been back in the market. And I know the soybean market is really hoping that they will come back in, the Chinese uh, will come back in and start buying some U.S. soybeans later on in the season, July and August. My personal opinion is I do think some of that will happen. Um, however, right now, the when you look at export bids, the Brazilians export uh, bid is much, much lower than it is here in the U.S. And so I do expect at least short term for the next couple of months, China will continue to buy from the Brazilians, at least for their soybean supplies. On the next slide, it's, this is really preparing the same information, just saying it in a little bit different way. Um, again, this is cumulative sales. So again, every time China buys something, we add it to the pile. You can notice that the pile of sales this year is much lower than it has been historically, but again, following a more similar typical pattern. The real reason I wanted to throw this graphic in here was to show you that total soybean exports from the US to China this year at this time of year is almost exactly the same amount as what they had purchased last year. Now, again, the purchasing pattern was very different, but the total quantities are very, very similar. And so to be very honest, I don't know, unless we have some really large export sales to China later in the season, again, into that July, August time period, I, I really don't see a big burst of purchases, at least for, for China in buying U.S. soybeans. The next slide, we shift into wheat, and again, kind of the same perspective. I wanted to show the blue line, which is what USDA calls the food line or the food consumption. That really is U.S. wheat going into the domestic milling um, industry. Um, that tends to be very flat, very stable. Um, you know, given the coronavirus issues right now, we are seeing a little bit of an uptick in in bread and and pasta consumption. But I don't know that th those will be large enough throughout the whole year to really have a big impact or have a big burst 
in that blue line. Um, I, I think that USDA's forecast is going to be relatively close, maybe a, up a little bit. When we look at exports, which is the red line, that bounces around quite a bit. Again, very difficult to forecast wheat exports just because it's a very complex market. So the next slide shows U.S. all wheat exports. So this is all wheat. We don't care what class it is. But our wheat export sales this year have been, you know, better than we've seen in the last several years. Again, um, the black line is 2016-17. We're seeing some numbers very similar to that now. We have seen a slight downtick the last couple of weeks, uh, although there was an announcement this morning that uh, China did come in and buy about 165,000 metric tons of U.S. wheat. It was hard red winter wheat. Um, it was announced this morning. That's about two and a half cargoes or two and a half vessels of wheat. So that's very positive. China hasn't bought wheat from us in, in a long, long, long time. They are now starting to make some purchases, and, and hopefully that'll put some support underneath the U.S. wheat market. On the next slide, it's the exact same cumulative export sales, but this is now for hard red spring wheat only. So we're now separating out how is spring wheat doing relative to the other wheat classes. And again, we started off the year not in too bad a shape. Our exports were you know, uh, average to slightly above. We're not getting quite the export pace we did in 16, 17. Uh, but again, hopefully we'll have some opportunities a little bit later on in the marketing year. Now, again, the answer to that will really depend upon how quickly our customers, our major customer base, can recover from the COVID-19 problems that they're having in, in their respective countries. So my last slide, I just wanted to show which countries do we need to pay, be paying attention to. Again, when we talk about an economic downturn with a potential recovery, when we look around the globe and recognize that a lot of other countries and economies are having problems with the coronavirus issues, what are the countries we need to really focus on when it comes to US export sales? So I rank this based off of last year's numbers that again, just as that's the most common and in and, and our clearest memory of what we did last year. Um, for corn, our largest bios, buyer is Mexico. Um, second largest buyer is Japan. Third largest buyer is Colombia. Um, those three countries, if you look on the very bottom row, make up about 66% of all of our US corn exports. So those three countries are very dominant in our ability to be able to sell corn internationally. Um, shifting over to the soybeans, kind of the same layout. Uh, our number one customer, even last year, was still China. Our number two country was Mexico. Our number three customer was Egypt. All of those added together accounts for about 45% of our total export ex soybean exports last year. Wheat, uh, biggest purchaser is Philippines, very closely followed by Mexico. And again, those two countries tend to flip back and forth on who's number one and number two. And then we have Japan. Those three countries make up about 36% of our total wheat exports. Now, when you jump directly to hard red spring wheat only, it's really the Pacific, um, the South Pacific regions, um, excuse me, the South Asian markets are the ones that we really need to focus on. So hard red, uh, soft red, hard red spring wheat, excuse me, um, Philippines is number one, Japan number two, and Taiwan is number three. Those three countries make up about 50%, not quite 50% of our total export sales. So we need to be watching uh, countries like Mexico, like Japan, um, especially Southeast Asia for, for spring wheat to see how difficult a time are they having right now? How quickly are their economies going to recover? Because in my view, that's going to be one of those key variables to say how quickly can we increase our export sales and try and, 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 and get a price recovery back out um, on the backside of this once we get the virus under control. Um, so with that, I'll hand things over to Tim. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Uh, we did a review of last time and found out that I talked a little longer, so I'm going to try to cut it back a little bit. So if we go to my first slide, uh, I'm going to follow in Frayne's theme about exports because I, many of you know that we're predicting record uh, exports of our commodities this year. And of course, we have record, as I told you last time, we have record production of beef, pork, and chicken. So exports are important. Also, I want to highlight three uh, reports that come out from USDA just in the last week and the websites are shown there for each one and a lot of those as we go along but these are interesting reports so in the future you can look at them on your own if you want to. Uh, the first one came out yesterday is uh, from the Foreign Ag Services Livestock Poultry World Trade um, Markets 
And uh, this is a really, really neat report because, uh, and they do it quarterly. So this is again, the new, their new forecast for April, but they do for cattle, beef, hogs and pork and, and chicken, those three commodities. They do uh, by country, uh, the total production by country in the world, the total numbers of livestock, the total consumption by people and total imports and exports. So kind of a neat thing if, if you're in a discussion sometime and you wanna know the number of cattle in Brazil or hogs in China or uh, chicken exports to Korea or whatever it might be, just go to this and, and there's a, it's, it's a long, long report. What I wanna just basically talk about today is how uh, they think, how the Foreign Egg Service thinks that COVID-19 might change the global protein markets and so three, lines there on that chart starting in 2015 with the uh, green line, top green line being chicken and then the blue line beef and, and pork. We have been increasing exports of all three of those on a worldwide basis. Now I'll get to US in a minute. On a worldwide basis, we've had record trade in those commodities. And uh, initially before the COVID, we were thinking that two th or they were thinking 2020 was going to be another record year, but unfortunately, COVID is going to uh, affect demand some. So this most recent April report that just came out yesterday, they're backing beef uh, trade off by about two percent, which isn't huge. It's still historically relatively high, and chicken off by about one percent on a world basis, but still a uh, all-time record high for pork with the demand for China. So when we go to the next slide, then we'll talk more about the U.S. meat trade. This is the WASDE report that Frayne just mentioned and important in grains and showing exports and supply and demand. And so on the livestock side, I'm just gonna go into and take a table out of that WASDE report for the U.S. meat trade. And so, uh, the 2019 estimate is really good now, so that's a firm. And then, uh, and then for the uh, 2020, again, is a forecast. And this is by the Office of Chief Economist. Again, it comes out once a month, around the 10th of the month. And so you see those little broken record icons there. Uh, they have lowered their forecast a little bit from uh, the, the March 10th report, but still looking for record exports of beef, all-time record high exports of beef, up 138 million uh, from uh, pounds from last year. We go to pork, again, we're gonna break records by uh, over a billion pounds is again with the China demand. So there's still, this is yesterday's report, so they're still expecting strong exports in, in spite of COVID. And then on the broilers, again, for U, the U.S., as of last month, we're predicting record exports. You see that they changed it down from 200 in the March report. And so if you would, back in March, they were predicting 7.43 million um, pounds and uh, or billion pounds and uh, ratchet that back. So we aren't quite gonna, uh, as of now, gonna do a record check-in, but again, uh, very, very close. So, so far, uh, their prediction is still that we're gonna do very well and uh, records for beef and pork. So go to the next slide. Is another report that came out just last uh, Friday, not in time for me to talk about it last Friday, but the Economic Research Service uh, keeps track of exports on a monthly basis. Unfortunately, they're uh, almost, you know, over a month, sometimes gets to be almost two months behind. So just on last Friday, we found out what the February numbers are. So on the left-hand side, you see that uh, so far we were on track quite a bit above uh, last year. And um, when we, that dotted line is last year, and if you go to the end of last year, we did struggle uh, down on exports simply because uh, of Japan and Japan had settled the uh, agreements with uh, a number of our competitors and we had, so we were facing really, really high 
tariffs there. And now we uh, have a, an agreement as of January 1st with Japan. And so our exports are going back quite gangbusters into Japan. And so again, this is only for February and we got to look ahead and, and COVID and so on. But again, looking at those previous predictions, we're, we're still hopeful that we will have a good year. And going over to the pork side, again, you see by uh, end of October, November, last fall, that dotted line exports just skyrocketed. Again, that was all to China. In spite of 60% tariffs still on pork, we're sending a lot of pork to China, simply because our hog prices are quite low, as we talked about before. And so, we, you know, we've got a very low hog price and still with the tariffs moving a lot in. So you see January and February, they're just at all time unprecedented movement of pork into China. And on the bottom side, then again, our broiler exports were up as well. And so that, uh, you know, not quite a record, but that's good news. So we go to my last slide. I've shown you this slide every time. And so I don't want to give up on a good deal there, so to speak, but just kind of update you on the background of the cattle market. There's some good news in the market last week. Uh, again, when I talked to you last week, it, was, it had been an absolute dismal week. That red line there is again, the cash market uh, at the markets in North Dakota and the squares of the futures market. But we had a, just a terrible week last week. We did recover this week. Uh, the uh, cash market went up about $9 and cattle are still selling. The, the feeder cattle futures were up eight to $12. So you see for, for the fall there back up to around 130 when they were 120 last week. So uh, that, and one of the reasons for that is that the distant fed cattle futures did go up eight to $9 this week as well. However, the fed cattle cash market fell off this week about six dollars from 111 down to 105 we're slowing up slaughter we stopped the slaughter plant in iowa and we're having some struggles in Greeley and some of the other plants and so that is is slowing up uh, uh, capacity a little bit there and so even though fed cattle prices went down no feeder cattle prices went up and buyers are still uh, active although lower prices obviously than last year but like we talked about before, the Nebraska feedlots have uh, a lot of corn, a high moisture corn in the bunker, and we have less cattle to sell than we did last year. So that uh, helped influence prices. So that's all, wait for questions at the end and move to Dave to talk about bioenergy. Great, thanks, Tim. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioproducts Bioenergy Economic Specialist with NDC Extension. Uh, just moving right into kind of an overview of, of what's going on. Uh, in general, uh, the corn ethanol industry ha has rapidly reduced uh, production, uh, which is good because that's what uh, needs to be done uh, much faster than what's going on in petroleum uh, and refined petroleum products. Uh, so we've seen uh, at the consumer level a, a, a drastic decrease in, in vehicle miles, a, a tremendous use in the reduction in use of gasoline and ethanol, uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent just in the last uh, five, six weeks. Uh, and then, of course, just mentioned, you know, the corn ethanol industry is is has really begun uh, idling, shutting down plants uh, to to respond to to the demand side of things. Uh, that being said, there's still some additional reductions that are needed. I think that ethanol is pretty close, uh, but on the petroleum side, they've got a long ways to go. Uh, EIA itself has said for the second quarter that they expect a 40% reduction in gasoline use, and you could just translate that over to ethanol. Uh, so, you know, what we're seeing right now would ex be expected to persist for, for, for the rest of the quarter. Uh, and then probably the bigger thing to look out for in the future is this storage crisis. Again, we have limited uh, storage for, for crude and for re refined fuels in this country, uh, and stocks are rapidly building. And that's what my first uh, uh, graph shows. Uh, oh, so I guess I'm going to talk about corn ethanol first. So corn ethanol production, so what we've seen in the last two weeks is a 33% reduction of production. Uh, which does not quite correspond with the reduction in use. Uh, you know, a, a rapid decline, a uh, little bit of little bit of a leg, um, but 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 really kind of getting to where it needs to be. Uh, the 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 chart shows uh, production last year and this year, uh, and the the measure is the annualized uh, ethanol production level. So typically, we're 
right around 15, 16 billion gallons for, for ethanol. And right now we're just above a, an annual rate of 10 billion gallons with still a little bit to go. Uh, looking at what this means in terms of prices or what ethanol refineries are looking at, going back to USDA's South Dakota uh, ethanol report, uh, you know, seeing an 18% uh, lower prices for, for the corn that's purchased at those plants, a 42% reduction in ethanol, uh, in, you know, as low as 68 cents. And, and right now the, the, the margins are not good. And then, of course, on the livestock side, which is getting a whole lot of attention, is that, that dramatic increase in the price of distiller's grains. Again, as that supply has declined significantly, uh, it, that price of distiller's grains has, has, has risen uh, because it has found a, a, a good spot in, in the nation's rations, uh, and folks are not easily replacing that, at least for the time being. Uh, looking at the next slide, uh, here's here's my, my slide on stocks. This last week, we had the the greatest increase in stocks in crude oil in history, uh, basically up about 2 million barrels of oil per day, 15 million barrels over the week. Uh, and, and really what you kind of see at, at the end of that uh, blue line, which is the, the actual stocks level, is you know, we're, we're rapidly increasing to that rate, you know, somewhere, uh, somewhere close to 550, the official number of, of commercial storage is about 650 million barrels, uh, but things get really tight at, at 550. Um, and, and, you know, as we get closer and closer, uh, which is definitely expected in the next few weeks, and as we get to that number, things are going to get messy. Um, one of the impacts that's going to have is it's going gonna, it's gonna to echo throughout the, the, the transportation fuel industry. Uh, and some folks are going to be better positioned than others just on their location uh, and, and maybe just having a little bit storage than, than other folks do. Uh, going to the last slide, uh, just looking at what's going on in the Bakken. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of at the end of the line uh, with most of our refinery located in the Gulf. Uh, WTI, the, the Cushing price is actually, uh, and, and the Cushing price, they're really not that close to uh, the Gulf either. Um, but kind of looking at what's going on is there, there is a, a change in the spread, which is that green line uh, with, with Bach, the Bakken selling at a, a significant discount, about 10 bucks uh, to WTI the last week. And you know, that's really important because as things fill up, the, the, the market's going to signal differently to different, different types of oils, different locations of, of what exactly they want. Uh, this chart also shows the, the, the rig count, uh, which is the blue line. Uh, it's a little bit dated. What I have here is the Baker Hughes number, which is an industry number, uh, which actually ended for last week. Uh, as we look at what's going on locally, uh, the, the state has actually reported that we're now down to 36 rigs in the state, which is down, uh, you know, significantly, you know, more than a dozen in the last two weeks, uh, which means that, that we're responding. And again, the question is how, how much lower we might uh, end up going. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate uh, everyone tuning in. If you have questions, as you can see, we use the chat. Um, also, we have the feedback form just to remind you that um, three quick questions. Um, and before we get any questions here, are there any thoughts? Sometimes when you guys talk, one guy comes up with something they didn't think of. Do you have any thoughts, guys? It's a holiday. We're not thinking very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that is an uh, exception. I I'm I'm really pleased that people showed up, even though it is a holiday, but I also appreciate you guys doing this on a consistent basis. Um, we'll just go a little longer here without, if we don't have any comments or questions and we can end our webinar, but we'll just give it just a little bit more time just in case. One thing, uh, one thing I just thought of that I didn't present is on the, uh, CARES Act tax rebates, in other words, the payments to individuals. If anyone on here or anyone listening, if you're a, the person, a kind of person who has to pay taxes at the end of the year or you have to mail in a check, um, there's very good likelihood that the IRS does not have your direct deposit information. And if you use, I think I read, if you use their direct pay uh, site, that that's not necessarily controlled by them. And so they're going to be putting up a portal. I don't know if it's up yet or not. I haven't checked lately, but uh, where you can add, add in your direct deposit information to receive that money. 
otherwise they're going to send you a, I, I, they said April 20th, maybe, possibly, they're going to mail out a paper check uh, on or about April 20th to the last address shown on your most recent tax filing. Thanks, Brian. There is a question. Um, anything on the 9 billion USDA has uh, for livestock and specialty crops programs? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? This is yep. Tim. Yep. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, having some problems here with the speaker. Yeah, no more new things than I gave you last week. All the commodity groups are sending stuff to USDA and they have gotten a lot of them. Uh, we expect both the national and the state organizations, and again, this includes cattle, hogs, sheep, dairy, even all the minor livestock classes. Uh, they're sending stuff to USDA and pretty much those will all be in next week. And then, it, however, USDA has a monumental task then to sort through that. All livestock producers are going to get something. But like I said last week, uh, everybody wants a big slice of, even though 9.5 sounds like a lot, it's a small, uh, uh, will be a small number of wants. So everybody's gonna get something. There's already talk, are there gonna be more? And uh, we don't know that. There, maybe will be the way Brian's talking and the trillions getting thrown around. But anyway, we got to wait now. USDA has is, is de got the information from the commodity groups and the damages mm -hmm. of, from the, uh, all the different livestock groups. And so now they got to sort through with the money they have, how are they going to distribute it? So really nothing new. Yeah. And just to, to add to that on the specialty crop side, a very similar thing there. Um, I, I know there's been some uh, conference calls and some discussions with the commodity organizations as well as USDA, and they're trying to figure out, okay, what are what is the, the level of the need, but then also how can we come up with a procedure um, that that may be equitable uh, for for the different, especially crops. On the major crops, of course, we have a lot more information about what's happening on prices, but also about quantities and inventories, uh, we just do a better job of tracking some of the bigger commodities, the, the specialty crops um, gets to be more of a challenge. And again, that I think that will also have an influence then on how USDA structures this program. But I know there's, there's a request for information, um, a, a basic request for ideas, uh, and, and more importantly, an estimates of what they think the damage is. And, and one of the arguments or one of the things that that I know I have been uh, been making and, and as I've been talking to people and talking to some of the commodity organizations is obviously this isn't over yet. And so the challenge becomes how do we, are we gonna have a sequence of programs or is this a one-off? My guess is it's good, there will be a sequence of, of support programs that will come along. Um, the, the issue is do we, how do we break that into, into pieces that are manageable and in making sure that the the program isn't overly burdensome and, and people can sign up relatively quickly. One of the, one of the big concerns, of course, is FSA of a farm service agency staffing. Um, they already have multiple programs that they need to be administering, not only with Arkham PLC where the signup is already completed, but we have the WIT plus program. Um, you know, they had to put uh, quite a bit of on hold part of the workload on hold because of the MFP payments. Um, so right now, you know, the, the USDA, in particular, the FSA staff is, is pretty much overwhelmed with the existing programs. And now we're going to come out with some additional ones or new ones. And, and again, the concern is information needs, not only from the farmer, but then also from, from FSA and, and what, what the process will look like. So all of those things are being discussed right now. We don't have any real clear vision or information about what's going on, but please stay posted and we'll try and get you the information as soon as it's available. I have another question for Dave. What will happen when refined fuel capacity is maxed out? Yeah, yeah. So the question, it, I think, it's storage. So when, when essentially we run out of storage within the within the supply chain, uh, this is a physical issue, not a price issue. The, the market right now, the prices are telling folks to to slow down, uh, in some cases, stop production, especially on the on the on the crude oil, uh, refined petroleum product side. Again, you know, this is you're talking about a physical. Um, and so it's completely different. If there's no place to put it, what do you do? Uh, you know, as, as a refinery, do you shut off in the middle of the week because you're out of tanks, you're out of temporary storage? Um, you know, what do prices have to be? Prices can be negative. Uh, you know, you wouldn't see that at the retail level, but prices may become negative primarily for gasoline. 
Uh, and then, you know, you're just going to see this, this, this pushback all the way through the supply chain, you know, going upstream, just saying, you know, we're going to, we're going to fill up the pipes, you know, we're going to shut in the wells, uh, we're going to do what we have to do. And it would be, it would be nice if the, the oil industry is being as responsive as the corn ethanol industry is in, in ratcheting down production, given the, the market, you, given use and, and these market signals. And that's just really not happening. Um, you know, and it's, you know, we're getting these mixed signals. One thing I didn't talk about is these mixed signals we're getting with OPEC uh, and reducing production. Uh, you know, a week ago, there was thought that, you know, that, that a deal had been made. Early this week, it was off. Now it's back on again. Uh, for those who don't follow, this might seem surprising. For those who do, this is 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 what happens. Um, even if they kept their, even if they said they were going to follow through with their promises, within a few months or years, it would likely break down. Uh, crude options with negative strike prices. It's interesting. Um, you know, is your expectation that we would get there? I, I don't even know. Do they are they trading negative? I haven't I haven't looked. Um, but again, the expectation would be, and, and that wouldn't be on crude. I mean, crude is, is, is likely not going to be zero, uh, for, for example, WTI, it could be zero or negative in the Bakken. It could, it would, could definitely be zero or negative for other, uh, oil, sour oil, uh, heavy oil, which really doesn't fit well in refineries. Um, but, but across the board, you know, the signal is to slow down. And then the question too is, you know, if you have good storage, you know, if we had excess storage for some reason here in the Midwest, you know, prices would would be able to endure for a little bit. The 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 system would be able to work, uh, but you're going to see various disruptions uh, in 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 different localities and different regions of the country. Uh, again, if something doesn't start giving pretty soon, and again, it, it's too bad we're not driving because you know, if if we had a motoring public right now, this would be the lowest cost Memorial Day in decades to to drive around the country. All right. Well, I think we're uh, we're done with questions. We want to thank thank you, gentlemen, um, our Ag Econ specialists, for all the latest information. Thank you, those who joined us for yet another webinar, and we hope you have a good Friday.